Last time I spoke to you about certain spiritual realities of our relationship with supersensible worlds. I could equally say of the relationship between our human existence on earth and that between death and a new birth. This is because our life between birth and death is so bound up with the physical sensory world that it seems to us as if our life consists of this physical sensory reality. Between death and rebirth, on the other hand, our life is entirely interwoven with the supersensible world of spirit and seems to be encompassed by that different reality. Today I would like to continue this theme by discussing several other related facts and also the important conclusions we can draw from them. First and foremost, anthroposophic spiritual science can give us a vivid awareness that in considering ourselves here in the physical world, we find before us a real reflection, a picture of the supersensible world. A rock or a mineral is not a direct reflection of supersensible reality in the same way. Its nature is something I have described in my book titled Theosophy. By contrast, the human being cannot in many respects be understood at all simply in terms of what we see around us in the physical world of the senses. What surrounds us in physical reality allows us to grasp why salt crystals are cuboid in shape. While scientists have not yet fully explained what causes such things, we can say that a salt crystal can be understood in terms of what can be discovered directly in the realm perceptible to the senses. A human eye or ear, on the other hand, do not originate in and cannot be explained by factors in the physical sensory world, perceived by the physical senses. We are born with the inner form and external shape of an eye or an ear, bringing it with us as innate capacity. We do not acquire these either at fertilization or through powers at work in the womb. And the word, quote, genetic inheritance, close quote, will not do either as a vehicle for all that we do not really understand. This merely perpetuates illusion. The truth is that the inner forming of eye or ear is innate in us as disposition and is in a sense developed in advance in the spiritual realm of pre-earthly human existence. This happens in collaboration with higher spiritual beings, the beings of the higher hierarchies. Between death and a new birth, in many respects, we ourselves develop the spiritual form, spiritual germ or seed of our future physical body, then implant this spirit germ after shrinking or contracting it to the necessary extent into our physical DNA. By this means, spirit is filled with physical sense-perceptible substance, becoming a physical sense-perceptible embryo. But the whole form, the inner form of an eye, E-Y-E, the inner form of an ear, are elaborated from the work we undertake between death and rebirth with supersensible beings of spirit. When we consider a human eye, therefore, or an ear, we must not assert that like the salt crystal, they are comprehensible in terms of what can be perceived around us in the sense-perceptible world. If we wish to understand a human eye or ear, we have to resort to secrets we can discover in the supersensible world. We must realize that the form of an ear, for instance, let's stay with this now, emerges from the supersensible world, and only after it has been so formed does it embark on its sensory task in the medium of air, hearing physical tones or speech sounds in the earthly realm in a physical way? Thus the human being is a reflection of processes and beings in the supersensible world. Let us consider the specific details of this for a moment. In tracing the inner form of the human ear, we look through the external auditory passage and see what is called the eardrum. Behind it sit the three tiny ossicles 
which science calls the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. Passing beyond these, we enter the inner ear, which I will not now describe in full. The very names science gives to these tiny bones shows that it does not have the faintest idea of what is involved there. Illumined by anthroposophic, spiritual science, we can find, and I am moving from within outward in my reflections here, that the stirrup or stapes connected to the inner ear appears as a transformed metamorphosed thigh bone or femur interlocking with the hip. What science calls anvil, this tiny ossicle, appears as a transformed kneecap or patella. And the ossicle pointing from this anvil toward the eardrum, the hammer, appears as a transformed lower leg or shank with the foot attached. Here the in quotes foot in the ear is not resting on the ground, of course, but on the eardrum. Inside your ear you do actually have a transformed limb. You could also compare this with the arm, upper arm and lower arm, although the anvil would be missing from that picture since the kneecap part is not properly developed in the arm. Just as your two legs negotiate the ground and sense it, so the foot in your ear, that tiny ossicle, senses the eardrum. The difference is only that the earthly foot you walk on is coarser in form, and you use it to sense the ground in a fairly rough and ready way, whereas the hand or foot you have in your ear is continually sensing the fine resonance of the eardrum. If you continue inward you come to the cochlea, filled with fluid. All this is necessary for hearing. What the foot senses at the eardrum has to be conveyed inward into the cochlea lying in the auditory chamber. Above our femur lies our innards or intestines, and this cochlea in the ear is, in fact, a very finely developed kind of intestine. In this way you can actually picture a human being in the ear, whose head is embedded in our brain. In fact, we bear within us a whole number of more or less metamorphosed human forms, and this one inside the ear is just one of them. What is actually at work here? You see, someone who studies human development with more than the coarse sensory means employed by modern science, and who knows that this human embryo formed in the womb is an image of a life preceding earthly life, will also know that the initial stages of embryonic development essentially, essentially form the incipient head. The rest of the embryo consists of small appendage organs. These appendages, little stumps that become the legs and feet, could equally well become a kind of ear if it were only a matter of the embryo's own inner capacities in the womb. The appendages have the potential to become an ear. In other words, the human fetus could certainly grow an ear down below there as well as here and there. This seems paradoxical, but it is absolutely true. We could also grow an ear where our limbs are. Why does this not happen? It does not, hap it does not because at a certain stage of development in the womb, the embryo falls under the sway of earthly gravity. Gravity, which makes a stone fall earthward, encumbers it with weight, bears down on a part of the embryo, seeking to become ear, and reconfigures the whole of our lower organism from it. Under the sway of earthly gravity, the ear that seeks to grow below becomes instead our lower body. And why does the ear itself not grow its ossicles into pretty little legs emerging from the right and left of our head? This is simply because the whole position of the human embryo in the womb protects the ear from succumbing to the realm of gravity in the same way as the leg appendages. For this reason, the ear retains for longer the predisposition it acquired in pre-earthly existence in the world of spirit. It is a pure image of these worlds of spirit. But what lives in these spiritual worlds? 
Well, I have often spoken of the reality of the music of the spheres. And as soon as we enter the world of spirit that lies beyond the soul world, we find ourselves in a world that lives all together in sounds and tones, in melody, harmony, and tonal accords. And from this realm of tones and sound the human ear forms. We can say, therefore, that our ear preserves a memory of our spiritual pre-earthly existence, which we have forgotten in our lower human organism, instead adapting the latter to earthly gravity, to all that originates in weight. If we understand the human form properly, the way we are shaped and configured, we can always discern how one organ system has adapted more to the earth while another remains more in tune with pre-earthly existence. Consider, after all, that even after we're born we perpetuate the predisposition implanted in our embryo. Only after we are born do we learn to stand upright and walk, to integrate ourselves fully into gravity, and orient ourselves in the three directions of space. But the ear removes itself from these three dimensions and retains its affinity with the world of spirit. As human beings, our form is partly always a living memorial to the work we undertook with higher beings between death and a new birth, and partly also it bears witness to the fact that we incorporate ourselves into earthly existence, which is subject to the sway of gravity, of weight. But such reconfigurations do not just happen in the direction I have now described. The reverse is true also. You walk around on the earth by using your legs, and they carry you, forgive me, into good, better, and worse actions. Ultimately, it is all one to the legs themselves whether they are walking into good or evil deeds with you. Yet as true as it is that the lower human organism arises through metamorphosis of a potential ear, so that we can stand upon earth with our legs, so it is equally true that all morality enacted by our capacity for movement, whether you walk toward good deeds or bad, is transformed after you pass through the gate of death into tones and sounds, not immediately, but after some time. Let us assume, therefore, that someone has been carried away into a bad action, Here on earth all we can see is that his legs have carried him for this purpose. But the bad deed attaches to these leg movements when you pass through the gate of death. After laying aside the physical body and also the ether body, everything embodied in such leg movements is transformed into a discord or dissonance in the world of spirit and the whole of our lower organism is reconfigured back into head organization. The way you have moved upon earth becomes head organization after death and is imbued with a moral nuance. And then you hear with these new ears how you behaved morally in the earthly world. Your moral actions become beautiful music. Your immorality becomes ugly discord. And from these harmonious or dissonant tones you hear emerging the words of judgment as spoken by the higher hierarchies upon your deeds. Thus by observing the human being himself we see how a transition occurs from the world of spirit into the sense world and from the sense world back into the world of spirit again through one transformation after another. Your head organism is used up, exhausted in your present incarnation. In this earthly life where it is fitted to perceive the spirit within the sensory realm. But after death this head falls away, and the other part of your being, everything other than the head, transforms after death into a spiritual head, a head organism. And this other part of you will become your head in your next life. You see, the very form of the human being expresses the reality of recurring lives on earth. No one can understand the human head if he does not regard it as a transformation of the body a person had in his previous life. 
and no one can understand the body as it appears now without seeing in it the seed of a head in a person's next life. To fully comprehend the human being, we have to permeate what we perceive through our senses with perceptions of and insights into the supersensible realm. There are various other specific things we can outline in connection with this. Last time I spoke here, I said that in the period between death and rebirth, we experience a state in which we become fully united inwardly with the beings of the higher hierarchies. Basically, we forget ourselves, actually becoming the higher hierarchies. We would never come back to ourselves if we could not extinguish this feeling of the higher hierarchies within us. Precisely by going out of ourselves, we return to ourselves again. By contrast, here, on earth, we come to ourselves when we disregard the outer world and focus upon our inner experience. Whereas between death and a new birth, we come to ourselves when we disregard what is within us, the higher hierarchies. The powers that later remain available to us from the return to ourselves are the powers of memory, while the powers that remain with us from our union with the beings of the higher hierarchies are those of morality and love. All that enables us to lovingly extend our own being on earth to other beings. In our earthly capacity to love, we must see an echo of our life in union with the higher hierarchies. And in our memory, we have an echo of the other state, when during the life between death and the new birth, we release ourselves from the higher hierarchies and come back to ourselves. A little while back I suggested that this resembles the process of breathing. We have to breathe in to enliven ourselves, and then breathe out the, quote, air of death, close quote, one might say, since what is exhaled is not something we can live in. In the same way, we breathe spiritually in the world between death and rebirth, uniting ourselves with the beings of the higher hierarchies, then departing from them again. On earth we have an after-echo of this heavenly breathing. The fact that we can walk upon earth means that we adapt to earth's gravity. This is the experience of weight, through the transformed ear, as I said. And if we see things in the right light, we can discern how, in our organs of speech and singing, we possess a metamorphosis of the predisposition we have in the world of spirit as we pass through pre-earthly existence. Here on this earth we adapt our speech organs to human language. Between death and rebirth we assimilate the Logos, the cosmic word, incorporate it into ourselves, and our whole organ of speech and singing is elaborated from this cosmic language. In the same way, though less strongly, that we transform this downward extending ear into our limbs for our directional walking, so we also transform our organ of speech and singing. In the case of the ear, we have only a faithful copy, if you like, of what developed in the world of spirit in pre-earthly existence, whereas the organ of speech occupies a middle position in this regard. We only learn to speak after birth, of course. But that is really just an illusion. In truth, the cosmic language, the logos, forms our larynx and our whole speech and singing organ. We forget the universal logos as we incline toward earth and pass through the embryo stage. But what has pushed itself down into the unconscious realm is refreshed and reawoken when we acquire human language. But in this human speech, basically, we can hear both earthly qualities and what the Spirit has shaped. We would be unable to form consonants if we could not adapt to external earthly things. If you have some sense of these things, you will be able to feel that one consonant is reminiscent of something angular, while another recalls something seed-like. 
in the consonants, we adapt ourselves to the forms, the configurations which the external world presents us with. In vowels, on the other hand, we voice our inner experience. If you say, ah, you know that something like wonder or amazement lives in you, which this vowel expresses. Oh, likewise, voices an inner experience. Each vowel expresses an inner quality. You see, one day science will be imbued with spiritual science and will be all the more interesting. It will discover that in cultures whose languages have a great preponderance of consonants, people cannot so easily be held to account for their moral actions, since they are less responsible for these actions than are people who speak languages more fully endowed with vowels. The vowels are an echo of our community with the spiritual hierarchies. We bring this with us, bear it into earthly conditions, and it remains in us as the manifestation of our own being. In consonants, on the other hand, we adapt to the outer world. The world of consonants is an earthly one. If we could imagine a language consisting only of consonants, it would be a language which an initiate would tell you relates to the earth. If you wish to have more of a heavenly element, you would need to add the vowels. But watch out, for then you become responsible to the divine realm, which cannot be treated so profanely as the consonantal realm. In recognition of this, the ancient Hebrews only indicated the vowels in their script, writing the consonants alone. Basically, heaven and earth resound together in our speech. And here, once again, we see how we have something that belongs to our middle realm and is, as it were, oriented in two ways, toward both the heavenly and the earthly. The head is entirely oriented to heaven, the lower organism to the earth, but the latter strives toward heaven, and to such a degree that it actually becomes it once we have passed through the gate of death. Our middle sphere, which includes breathing, along with speech and song that are carried on the flow of breath, connects heaven and earth. This is why this middle sphere is in every respect the disposition in us primarily inclined to artistic expression, to the uniting of heaven and earth. And so we can sum up by saying the following. As we observe the developing human being, we find he is born without any orientation in the world. He cannot walk, he cannot yet walk, or stand. He is born with the potential to relate to gravity, something he acquired prior to birth when gravity prevailed over his organism apart from the head. Organs of sight and hearing are rested free of gravity. We then develop spatial orientation and learn to stand upright and walk. This is a capacity we acquire after birth, of course, since the world of spirit has not yet configured us to master spatial orientation. If we did already possess this orientation, while we might be able to sleep on the earth, since after all the auditory ossicle that represents the foot has a horizontal orientation, we would be unable to walk. Something similar is true of the eye, UIE. You see, one thing we only learn fully on the earth is to adapt what we acquired in pre-earthly existence to the earth's gravity. The second thing, as we learn to speak and sing, is to adapt to our earthly surroundings. And then we also learn to think. We are born without any orientation toward walking or standing. We are born without speech. And we are also born without thoughts. One cannot, you see, say that infants can already think. These three things we learn fully only on earth. And all three are the metamorphosis of other capacities we possessed in pre-earthly existence. All three of them are living memorials to the spiritual disposition laid down in us in pre-earthly life. Now, last time I described how memory, here on earth, is the echo of our self-awareness in the world of spirit, while love in all forms is the echo of our experience of being poured out into the world of the higher hierarchies and merging with this world. 
And now we have our physical abilities, walking, speaking, singing, and thinking. To think that earthly thinking is a spiritual capacity is mistaken, for it is certainly tied to the physical body, just as walking is. And so we have our most outstanding corporeal abilities as a transformation or metamorphosis of something spiritual. What spiritual attribute do we have on earth? Sensory perception. The fact that we can hear, smell, taste, and so on, everything involved in sense perception, relies on organs lying at the outer periphery of our organism, which are elaborated from the highest spiritual regions. The ear originates in the harmony of the spheres. It is formed so strongly from the harmony of the spheres that it remains safe from gravity. And the way the ear is embedded in its fluid is to protect it from gravity, so gravity cannot get a purchase on it. The ear is really not a citizen of the earth, but a citizen rather of the loftiest spiritual world. So are the eye and the other sense organs. If we consider the body in walking, speaking, singing, and thinking, we find a metamorphosis there of the spiritual realm in pre-earthly existence. In the soul domain, memory and love are a transformation of spiritual life in pre-earthly existence. And the senses, lastly, are metamorphoses of the most sublime spiritual realm of pre-earthly existence. Here our anthroposophic science of the spirit connects with Goetheanism, with things Goethe was already aware of, but it also takes it further, entirely in keeping with the spirit of Goethe. I have often quoted Goethe's phrase about the eye being formed, quote, by light, for light, close quote. This is true, but it is not formed by and for the light we actually see. The light we see could never create the inner formative powers for an eye, E-Y-E. Take a human countenance, its noble brow, the jutting nose, the eyes and whole physiognomy. Then add gestures. We might record all this by some device, but this would only give us its shapes and forms. But if we look at a person before us, we are not content with the spatial discernment of form, Instead, we look through the spatial forms and movements of a person's gestures to the soul at work in them. Sunlight reaches us. There is the sun outside us and sunlight shines down. That is the external aspect, behind which is hidden the other aspect, the spirit of the sunlight. And it is in this soul and this spirit that we dwell between death and rebirth where light is something different. When you speak of someone's glance or look and are speaking of a soul quality that reaches us through their eyes, you are really speaking of something that lies behind the eyes in the realm of soul. And if I speak of the spiritual quality in light, this is the soul of light. An eye, E-Y-E, that already exists sees the external aspect of light, its physical property. But the eye itself is formed by the spirit, the soul by light, by what underlies or lies behind it. And so, if we have really understood what Goethe means, we ought to say, the eye sees the light, but is formed, created by the soul and spirit of the light, before it acquires physical corporeality here on the earth. The whole human being presents us with reconfigured, spiritual essence that passes back again into a spiritual condition. At death you pass back your physical sense organs to the earth, but what lives in the physical sense organs shines forth between death and a new birth and actually becomes your inner community with the spiritual beings of the higher hierarchies. And now you will understand the extent to which the resonant earthly world is a physical reflection of the harmony of the heavenly spheres, and how we are not an outcome of these earthly powers, but of the heavenly powers, and integrate ourselves into earthly powers. We have seen how we do this. 
Our lower organism would become ear if we remained heavenly and could not walk but would have to acquire a different means to move, would move upon the waves of cosmic harmony instead. Just as, in a small reflection of this, the ossicle moves on the waves of the eardrum. We learn to hear with our ears and with our larynx and the organs situated around the mouth. We learn to speak and sing. Let us imagine that you hear a particular word, say tree. You can speak this word yourself and connect a meaning with it. Hearing the word tree means that what you utter in the simple word tree lives in your ear in the way I have just described, in organs formed as the embodiment of heavenly activities. When you utter the word tree, this means that earthly air passes through the larynx and the instrument of your mouth in a shape and formation which manifests this word, which you also hear. But there's more than this, something not generally perceived sufficiently. When you hear the word tree, your etheric body quietly says tree as well. This is something you do not do with your physical body, but your etheric body. Through the eustachian tube, which passes from mouth to ear, Etherically, the word tree rises from within to meet the word tree coming from outside you. They resonate together. The two meet, and by virtue of this you understand the word. Otherwise you would hear it, and it, would, and it could be anything. You only grasp it, understand it, because through the eustachian tube you say back the word coming from without. And as the vibrations from without meet those from within and interweave, inwardly we understand what comes toward us from without. You see how wonderful is the interplay of things in the human organism. But something else is connected with this. Imagine that you wish to inquire into the nature of the human ear, eye, nose, and so forth. Fine. You tell yourself that science has made wonderful advances and that although such progress is expensive, it is worth it. So we purchase ourselves a large volume on physiology or anatomy, or we sign up for a university course and attend lectures on the eye or ear. You can learn a great deal in this way, and yet I think it is true to say that your soul will remain unmoved, your sensibility will stay cold. Listen to how physiology describes the ear your feelings will not be engaged. In this sense, the account is very objective. But when I describe things to you as I now have done, how we understand the word tree, how the ear is an image of heavenly activity, I would like to meet the person who feels no stirring of feeling, who fails to sense the wonderful nature of these phenomena. As I gave the description today, it is incomplete and needs to be rounded out but one would have to be inwardly arid to feel no sense of wonder at such things, at the way we human beings emerge from the world of spirit and incorporate ourselves into the physical world. Anthroposophic spiritual science has this quality. It presents these things with as much much objectivity as mainstream science. There is nothing subjective mixed in with my account of the ear formed from the heavenly spheres, but at the same time one's feelings and sensibility are engaged. The second aspect of our being, our soul life, which is intimately connected with the whole of our human nature, is also engaged. In other words, what the head acquires through such a science at the same time involves the heart. Anthroposophic science draws on the human heart and is therefore not just head knowledge, It not only fills the head, but fills us fully, the whole of us, with our blood circulation and heart as well. If you take seriously what I have said, then you can apply this in turn to the movement of the legs, study the mechanism of leg movements from this perspective. If you read up on the physiology of leg movements as mainstream science describes this, you will certainly not feel any stirring of your sense of responsibility. 
For the moment you learn that the good or bad actions into which you are carried by your legs resound toward you after death as harmony or discord, then your knowledge about the human being will immediately be associated with a sense of responsibility, one that henceforth accompanies your will actions. Not only our feelings but our will too is invoked by what our head initially assimilates in just as objective a way as in empirical science. But then it reaches beyond the head, pushes further into our feelings and will. For this reason anthroposophic science speaks to the whole human being, contrary to the increasingly current view that knowledge is only worthy of the name if it addresses the head alone. What speaks only to the head leaves the soul and sensibility cold, and does not begin to impinge on our will. We do face a crisis at present, and this means it is essential to acquire knowledge of supersensible worlds through our whole being. Even at the first stage of this, knowledge gained through imagination, we have to develop, we have to actively develop this faculty. We develop ordinary knowledge in certain academic circles that are particularly suited to it. We load ourselves up with this knowledge like beasts of burden, commit it to memory, fill our minds with it. By contrast, if we practice exercises such as those I described in Title Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, and thereby acquire imaginative perception, or if we have the inner disposition to see the world in spiritual terms, as I described this capacity in my book on Goethe's worldview, then we are already practicing etheric perception, which is at the same time a more direct form of experience. Then we no longer have to give ourselves up so passively to the world. You cannot cram yourself with spiritual science in the same way as theoretical knowledge, and those who are used to such a yoke will not take kindly to the liberation of spiritual science, but it has to be developed actively. You have to be inwardly active and even then it is true that what we first acquire in imagination is very fleeting and soon vanishes. It does not easily lodge in the mind or memory. After three days it will have faded, certainly. Everything gained by exerting the faculty of imagination will be gone. This is also why our memory in the ether body fades roughly three days after death. The length of time varies. You can read more about this in my book titled Occult Science, also known as Esoteric Science, readers aside, and, and Steiner again. Our memories remain with us for about three days until the etheric body dissipates. And in the same way, someone who has developed the ability to perceive etherically knows that without all the efforts needed to bring down this knowledge into ordinary concepts, it will have evaporated after three days. You can already see from this that imaginative thinking addresses the whole person and that this whole person must live in such imaginative perception. In still higher forms of knowledge, this is so to an even greater extent. There is no cause for surprise at this. We can also come to recognize that a great deal more exists in the world than the outer senses can perceive. After all, we can discover the possibility of living in a world in which the dimensions of space no longer have any meaning. Music gives us a foretaste of this, of a non-spatial realm. Physical space is outside us, really externally present, whereas within us, in the sphere where music is realized, space only plays a role at most as a kind of after-image. In imaginative perception, the spatial element gradually ceases entirely and everything becomes temporal. In the realm of imagination, time has the role which space has in the physical realm. And this now leads us to another thing, to the realization that temporal things remain. The temporal realm is in fact an enduring realm. If you develop the capacity for imaginative perception, you will gradually learn to perceive every moment of the life on earth that you have had so far, 
you can become eighteen again, even when you are very old. You can perceive your youth with the same vividness as you perceived it when you were eighteen. Imagine that when you were eighteen you lost someone you loved a great deal. Try to picture the vividness of your grief at the time. Then think how pale the memory of such an event will have become after thirty years, or not even thirty, less will do. Memories fade even in the most deeply feeling person, and this is inevitable in ordinary outward life on earth. But precisely because a memory fades as time passes, it remains within you as a real part of your human nature. And you can, and we can, indeed transport ourselves back, and are transported back after death experiencing what occurred with the same intensity once more. This is part and parcel of our human nature. What we have experienced remains and is only past because of how we perceive things. If you were born at the age of seven, living, say, in some different form of existence, in some kind of embryonic condition, and were then born, and got your second teeth right away, straight away, so that you had already so that you had already had your first teeth in the embryo, you could never develop a religious sensibility. A disposition to be religious could no longer take effect in the further course of your life on earth. All the religious sensibility you possess is present because the first seven years of your life are still there in you. You do not perceive them as being present, and yet they are there and present in you. In our first seven years we are entirely surrendered to the outer world. The religious mood is embodied in this. And we transfer it to other things. In these first seven years we have an urge to imitate everything around us. And later this same mood flows into devotion to the soul spiritual realm. If we were not born until we were fourteen, entering immediately into puberty, we would never develop morality, since this is something we have to acquire through the inner development of rhythm between the ages of six and fourteen. This is why we have such influence on a person's moral education in primary school as something we later carry in us. We always carry everything in us. If you cut your big toe, this is a good distance away from your head, but the pain you feel is still experienced via the head. If you have a religious sensibility today, this is because something still works in you that you inwardly experienced up to the age of six or so until the change of teeth, but at that time experienced only as devotion to your outer surroundings. In the same way that you feel pain in your big toe through the activity of your head, what you experienced up to the age of six or seven is still active in you when you are forty. It is present. This has an important consequence. There are a great many people who say that anthroposophic spiritual science is fine in its way, and it's nice to hear about supersensible worlds, but they wonder why they need to know about experiences between death and a new birth, since they will find out soon enough when they die. If we meet these worlds between death and rebirth, they think, Why should we learn about them now? Why bother making such effort to learn about the spiritual world while still alive on earth? Well, dear friends, this is not how it is. The temporal realm is real. Just as the spatial realm is reality here in the physical world, so the temporal realm and even the super-temporal is reality for the super-sensible world. Here, later in your life, the child still lives in you. When you pass through the gate of death, the whole of this life is present in you in a single moment, belongs to you, to your organization. As a person here in physical space, you might just as well ask why you need an eye, E-Y-E, since light is all around you, as ask why we need spiritual science on earth. Light exists everywhere, but we need an eye to perceive it. When we enter the realm of spirit, we have the light of spirit all around us. And what we learn through anthroposophic spiritual science is not lost, 
but becomes the I, E-Y-E, with which we perceive spiritual light after death. If at our current stage of human evolution we do not cultivate a science of the spirit, we will have no eyes for the world of spirit when we come there and will be as blind to we will be as if blind to what we experience. In ancient times, as a consequence of their pre earthly life, people still possessed an instinctive clairvoyance. This capacity faded and disappeared, and we no longer have it. Humankind had to acquire a sense of freedom in an interim phase of evolution. But it has now entered a further phase where it needs an I, E-Y-E, for the spiritual world into which we enter at death. And people will not develop this I if they do not acquire it here on earth. Just as a physical I must be acquired in pre-earthly existence, so an I for perceiving supersensible reality after death must be acquired here through spiritual science, through spiritual perception. This does not mean one has to become clairvoyant, which is a matter for each individual. But the eye for spiritual reality can be developed too by using our healthy common sense to understand the results of spiritual scientific research. It simply is not true to say that we all have to gain perception of the world of spirit in order to believe what clairvoyants say. No, this is not so. If you use your healthy powers of reason, you will see that the ear is really a heavenly organ. The reality of this can only be discovered by clairvoyant research, but once discovered, it can be understood. One need only allow oneself to think it through and feel one's way through it. And then this recognition, through healthy powers of reason, of what has been discovered about the world of spirit, not clairvoyance itself, is what gives people clear vision after death. This eye of spirit is something the clairvoyant must also develop like anyone else. What we perceive through the faculty of imagination, what we see clairvoyantly, fades after a few days. And we can only retain it by bringing it down into the perspective of ordinary comprehension then we are compelled to grasp it in the same way as understood by someone to whom we impart it. You see, clairvoyance as such is not humankind's immediate task on earth. Clairvoyance need only exist in order to discover supersensible truths. Our real task on earth is to comprehend supersensible truths with our ordinary healthy powers of reason. This is extraordinarily important and is not acknowledged even by subtler modern minds. In Berlin, a little while ago, when I was explaining these things in a public lecture, someone stated it was very wrong of me to say that spiritual science can be understood through healthy powers of human reason. He asserted dogmatically that the inherently healthy faculty of reason can grasp nothing spiritual and that someone who does perceive spiritual things is, for that reason, unhealthy. He criticized me in those very terms. Such things are highly characteristic of our times. The idea that anyone who proposes the reality of the spirit must be in some way mentally ill. No greater wisdom than this is needed, apparently, and such wisdom is, sadly, very widespread today. You can see from this how true it is, as I always say, that the time has now come again when humanity depends on assimilating spiritual understanding, integrating it, and living with it. Anthroposophic spiritual science ought not to be something we acquire only theoretically. Those who do acquire it, in a real sense, must be aware that they are forming a core of humanity of spreading numbers of people who know that to be fully human requires knowledge of their connection with the Spirit. A magnificent feeling comes over us if we know this, and we must, above all, instill this knowledge into pedagogy and education. Ordinary head knowledge is morally neutral, really, as soon as we rise to spiritual realms we discover they are imbued with morality. 
You need only recall what I said. In community with the higher hierarchies, we develop love. And morality on earth is only a reflection of our experiences in heavenly spheres. But how do we experience what we call good? We make this our lived experience by recognizing that the human being is not just a physical, but also a spiritual being. If we really live our way into the world of spirit, we learn to absorb the good through our spirit. This is also the fundamental idea entitled the philosophy of freedom. We learn to absorb the good through the spirit, and if we do not do so, we are not whole human beings. Then we are crippled or maimed. It is like losing both your arms. If your arms are amputated, you will be physically crippled. If you lack the good, you are crippled in soul and spirit. Take this idea and employ it and its effect on feeling and will in education. Give people a living sense by the time they enter adolescence that they are only whole, only have the right to call themselves fully human if they are good. Then you will achieve real moral education, one fit for humanity. Whereas all tub-thumping moral sermons will achieve nothing at all. If you educate people to regard morality as belonging intrinsically to their individual being, and to consider themselves as crippled in some way if they do not have a moral compass, are therefore not whole, they will discern moral qualities entirely within themselves rather than as outward exhortations. No doubt many schools of thought will think this an abomination, un-German and so on although it is, in fact, the purest outcome of German thinking. It is something that brings the spirit as close as possible to human beings, to each individual. And this is essential today, because only the single and separate human being, the human individual, can take on his own full sense of responsibility in our present age. <laughs>